see the I that God or reality sees me is the same I that I see God or reality. Same seamless whole, a love without any boundaries and separations. No center, no inside and outside, and no perceivers anywhere. So this video is a collection of consciousness coaching sessions with my contemplative fitness AI. And some of the topics that I'll be covering are what is the relationship between mind and reality? See, one way to look at it is that there is no mind or self. There's just the whole world as it is. Another way to look at it is that there is no reality. There's only the mind or the self with a capital S. Both views are expressing the same truth. Uh, you can experience reality from one of these lens or both simultaneously. Now there's a third way. Both mind and reality vanish. I'll be talking about methods and practices for not just uh, accessing but locking uh, true nature from all different traditions and how to merge different practices together. And, uh, the raw of psychedelics, the ultimate the natural state is not a meditative absorption or a peak state on psychedelics. It's the fill in the blank that's revealed after you've transcended all meditative absorptions and mystical experiences and there is just what it is which is prior to and manifests all of existence, including consciousness. Now, even though this experience has been heavy right now, it's uh, what's always been the case. If you give this thing to the Frankian character uh, just a few days before the Big Bang, or to any random avatars on the street who has never stepped out of their minds, it will be the most mind-blowing experience ever. See, all fear comes down to the fear of not dwelling in the mind. Because the moment you step out of it, it's the end of the world. It's the end of your world, but the world as it is. And also be discussing how from a certain lens, uh, the whole process of awakening is a purely biological and physical process. So you should approach it like fitness, because you're tempering hacking the hardware, not the software. And it has very little to do with thoughts and ideas. That's why the whole notion or debate about idealism or materialism versus solipsism, or what is reality, uh, what is consciousness, uh, all that is a waste of time ultimately, it's not going to wake you up. <laughs> because the universe itself is not going to preoccupy itself with these questions through mental masturbation. Because again, you're transforming your entire nervous system. So it's not enough to move around the icons or trying to change the interface on the screen, that's the software, but going down to the deep structure circuitry of the hardware, but ultimately content and context are one. And there's neither the hardware nor the software. But uh, during the process, it's important to separate the two. So you don't just get lost in the story of the book, but getting down to the materiality of the book. Although again, there's no book and there's no story. <laughs> Arya Shante said that when he was going through the process of unfolding his dreamy mind, he could hear and feel uh, the brain circuitry physically getting rewired, like circuit board uh, flipping switches. And I was listening to the podcast about the swimmer uh, who woke up to non-duality uh, just by uh, holding his breath underwater in rhythm over years and years on end. He didn't know anything about spirituality, mysticism, or non-duality. See, the realizations are completely embodied uh, as a matter of direct experience. It changes the entire texture of reality in a visceral and kinetic way. Uh, the connectivity you feel with all things is entirely physical. Like the whole universe becomes your body. I suppose that's why we call it the Dharma body. And when you walk, is the whole world walking. Towards the end of this video, I'm going to give you a daily routine uh, program for awakening and thoughts on death and reincarnation. Uh, I started looking up like enlightened teachers because mm -hmm. usually I can't really like follow there's one in Australia as well. Uh, like he teaches not as much concentration, but more like surrender. Yeah, surrendering and concentration are actually the two sides of the same coin. But the way I did it was, uh, the way I recommend people is to skin the cat from all sides. So like I, I would make sure that you cover both the expansion side of things and the contraction side of things. So the contraction side of things is just your basic mindfulness, vipassana, uh, concentration stuff, like your access concentration, um, where you kind of zoom your awareness down to the microscopic sensations and investigate uh, experiences down to the atomic level. That's your mindfulness. That's the, uh, the contraction side of the equation, and the, the expansion part of the equation is just your like relaxation and do nothing meditation and you know, surrendering. When you take vipassana mindfulness concentration to the extreme, you are going to sort of what I call flipping yourself inside out and experience you know, vast empty space. That's what the the sixth jhana is. The sixth jhana is infinite consciousness. You have to have a lot of concentration to access 
infinite consciousness. And the more you can contract, the more you can expand. Because like the consciousness of mind is like a rubber band, right? And ultimately, expansion and contraction become one, and you let go of both of them. See, when you contract down to a nothing, uh, from the other side, you also expand to infinity. But, but then, there's no more room for contraction and expansion. And that's one way to unify the infinite school of Buddhism, or the Theravada path, and the Hindu non-duality school, or Zen, do not do meditation. Uh, one takes effort, the other effortless. You know, Buddhism focuses on the no-self side of the coin, and Hinduism focuses on the true self side of the coin. But again, taking to the extreme, they're talking about the same thing. The ultimate is probably letting go of both, or trying to find the middle way, which is the uh, what transcends both sides of any extremes so and no duality, not just this one, neither self nor no self kind of bullshit. So if you take the Vipassana path to the max effort level, you have the non-experience of cessation or fruition is the Olympic gold medal of meditation, where your entire universe blinks out of existence and then you know, reappears again. That's when the entire hardware of your being is being rebooted. And you see that, wait a minute, even consciousness is not a ground. It's also impermanent. And it's codependent and rising, creating with the object of consciousness. That's why I say, you know, the mind and the world, they co-create each other, you know, even though they're one and the same. Uh, no objects to be conscious of, no consciousness. So each time you have a cessation, more of your conditions and delusions get uh, rooted. And in turn, that causes a permanent shift to the Baisai consciousness of moment-to-moment -moment experience. That's why a lot of people do psychedelics, they have huge glimpses. But, you know, you can just tell by the way they move and they speak, their baseline consciousness hasn't been uh, permanently altered. So it's not like fruition or cessation is like, oh, the truth. It's just a tool. It's the, it's the tool that really uh, causes the damage at the neurological level of your nervous system. Like, it really changes the hardware. Nowadays, I can have a cessation on command because I'm always tap dancing in the event horizon between existence and non-existence, being and non-being. And uh, I think concentration is very important. It's more important than most people think. It's almost like practicing scales. If you don't practice scale well, you know, how are you going to play your concerto? And the fruition, again, it's uh, when you take concentration to the max effort. You're so concentrated. The reality or the mind is so concentrated on itself that it reaches a singularity and blinks out of existence for a bit. Uh, you can never have, have enough concentration in my experience, you know. Not out of the 10 times. If you're stuck in meditation, you know, if you just have a glimpse of non-duality, but it's not stabilized, go back to the basics and train your awareness. I mean, sorry, your concentration. And like a snowball effect, the more you can concentrate, the more effort you put into your practice, the more automatic the practice becomes. Until at the end, you don't have to do anything. And it also takes a lot of relaxation to attain high levels of access concentration. Right? You sort of have to you know, really like relax on a kind of way, you know, lean into the object of concentration. So industrial level concentration to me, it's almost like the strength of an athlete. Right? To be a good athlete, you have to transfer that strength into speed. And in non-dual awareness, when you are aware as awareness, not just off awareness. See, in the letter, uh, there's still a delay between you and that which you are aware of, right? But when the center or the you vanishes, every sensation is aware of itself without any delay. You know, every experience, every sensation is boom, it's instantaneous, right? In, in a sense, it's eternal. And paradoxically, it's also very quick. Actually, quickness is not even the right word because it transcends space and time. Right? There's no, there's no uh, space for even speed, in a sense. And so, you know, Einstein said that the speed of light is the only constant in the universe. Right? You can say that, you know, true nature, the only constant is that, um, that knowing. Right? That's why people equivalent that knowing, that sense of knowing, with uh, words like luminosity or light. Right? At the end, it's just the universe meditating to itself without a meditator. And by this point, the dichotomy between meditation and non-meditation breaks down. You know, because nature itself doesn't give a fuck about like, meditation or how concentrated the, the character is. All that's coming from the seeker. So that's why mindfulness is ultimately just a tool. You know, there is no mind to be mindful of, and even awareness is empty. Even emptiness is empty, which is why it's also full for the millionth time. And again, you can sprinkle self-inquiry on top of you know, both contraction and expansion. If you dissolve every single speck of solidity in your body-mind and eventually your field of experience, mm -hmm. you will reach the natural state. You'll reach, oh, like God or whatever, right? If you relax and just abide in awareness, for like uh, 10 years, 20 years, your body might will get dissolved. 
for the contraction, you're just using the breath as an anchor. But for the Dutati meditation, you're using nothingness or you're using awareness as an anchor. How would um, having awareness on the nothingness dissolve the body? Okay, so if you just unhook your identity from the body mind to this vast, boundless, spacious, luminous, panoramic, timeless awareness, you know, ultimately you have to disidentify from that too. But before you get to the ultimate, if you just abide there as a ground, the body mind with all its conditionings and shadows will be dissolved, right? Because you just sit there and do nothing. And then you just let them come out, let them come out, let them come out. You know, what does nature want to do? It wants every single being to return to the natural state. Right? So by surrendering and letting go, you know, as long as you don't interfere with this process um, of the solution, um, by piling on more conditionings, God will cleanse you up, so to speak. And with mindfulness of Vipassana, you're going in there and investigating and cutting through the layers of delusions. And this is why body scanning, especially Vipassana, is so powerful. Because you're bypassing thoughts and the software and using the laser beam of awareness, layer by layer, peeling away the solidity of the body. And in turn, the mind, and like Michelangelo, chipping away the marble to reveal the form underneath. But with this work, there's nothing inside. It's completely formless. And ta-da! What's been revealed is the same condition that you're abiding when you do the do-nothing meditation or Dzogchen practices. And as you become this boundless space without any locations, directions, you're not even trying to abide in it anymore. You see that everything is a modification of it. The body, sounds, thoughts, the visual field, objects and phenomena, even space and time and quote-unquote nothingness are just difference uh, in contraction and expansion of sensations. Wait, so I don't really do much do-nothing meditation. The only technique that's required for the do-nothing meditation is that you find any kind of solidity or contraction or resistance within your body mind or even within your visual field or like with the sound whatever you feel. yeah you just feel it and then you just kind of let it go you just relax it you just kind of michael taff calls it dropping the ball imagine you're a dog and you're just biting onto a ball uh clenching to a ball really tight and you just let it go that's it Right. Imagine clenching your fist, so you can do this exercise. Clench your fist and your face and your whole body really, really tight, and then just relax, surrender, and let it go. And that feels exactly like the transition from the separated state to unity. And see, most people spend their entire lives walking around, clenching their minds and their hearts so tight that they don't even know they're doing it. And their bodies are extremely tense because of it. When you relax the body, uh, you relax the mind and vice versa, and ultimately they're one system. And there's going to be a point where you feel like you're so relaxed that you can't even move the body. Because to move the body, you have to tense up. <laughs> and you can't even open your eyes uh, even if you try to uh, during this meditation of relaxing. And then you go on real life and it feels like you can't think a thought, you can't move the body at all. Even when your body's moving, it doesn't feel like you're moving it. <laughs> it feels like the entire universe is moving your meat in your mouth for you. <laughs> but wait, you are the universe. It's not enough to dissolve the, the perceptual center. That's your, the seer, the thinker, the doer, the observer the hearer. You also have to dissolve um, psychological centers through dissolving all your traumas, emotions, and attachments. But they're actually the same thing, just manifest differently, but it's just solidified sensations. When you draw the breath, that's like, almost like a contraction. When you let go of the breath, when you exhale, that's expansion. You can take a really deep breath and just pay attention and focus on the sensation of around your nostrils, uh, the particles in your nostrils, or even just the, uh, uh, the rising and falling of your stomach. And then you completely let go of the breath and you notice the effortlessness and the ease when you let go of the breath as your body sort of gives up the life force in order to draw a new breath in. Because breathing is so, sort of like an exchange with the whole fabric of existence, right? With each breath you receive, like you receive the universe and on the out breath you give yourself up and then you let yourself go and then you give up yourself to it as it. But there's no exchange really. Because the inner world is limitless and the outer world is also limitless. Now to sum up the do nothing meditation, really the only instruction is just to do nothing. Just sit. And a lot of traditions like Zhou Chen thinks this is the highest spiritual technique. But since it's technically still a sort of a method, there's still a tiny bit of doing something, right? Namely just to let go, which is not exactly doing. If it feels like you're getting caught up in an emotion, let it go. If it feels like you're getting caught up in meditation, let go of that. If it feels like you're struggling to let go, let go of that. <laughs> if it feels like you're constricting or tightening your body or emotions or your mind or anything you feel of experience, you let go of that. 
and you just keep relaxing away all tightening constrictions or the sense that you're doing anything at all. So how do you know if you're doing the do nothing meditation right? Or max it out so to speak. It's when you go on in real life and you just, after you just surrender to even surrendering and there's absolutely no difference at all between the, the do nothing meditation and real life. Now it's just the universe being aware of itself 24-7 uh, without any effort from the character. Um, this uh, duality between effort and effortless is something that would uh, resolve itself uh, the deeper you get into the path. And you realize all suffering comes from trying to change what's already happening. Because you can't change anything that is already happening on its own. And any kind of effort to change the what is creates tension. The sense of imperfection is nothing more than the energy of resistance to change the what is. And if you just allow everything to be as it is, imperfection turns into perfections like that. You're saying like the do nothing meditation would be like to a point where you're just not having feelings arising out of the body. You can still have sensations, right? But they're just happening by themselves and there's no solidity. So imagine before awakening, it's like whenever a sensation or emotion arises or a thought, it's like a, a, a solidified ball, right? But then after uh, awakening or during the process of uh, dissolution, the, the solidified ball will transform and dissolve into liquid and then eventually into smoke and then eventually into air. Again, you know, solidity and air, they're made of the same thing, right? It's just sensations that the only difference is the contraction versus the expansion. It's still sensations. So in the awakened state, um, when things arise, it's almost like, you know, just puffs of smoke arising in air. But it's still made up of air in a sense, you know what I mean? Because emptiness and form are identical. The ego is nothing but contractions of sensations and resistance of just, you know, contraction of energy. That's it. And the non-ego state is just an expansion of energy. Like God mind or whatever, you know, infinite consciousness. It's really fundamentally made up of the same thing, thing as the ego. It's just that the ego is the contracted version of that. I've talked about the expansion and contraction. But now you can actually combine the two sides of the extreme and ultimately see that they're both uh, just two sides of the same coin from the phenomenological level in real time. So there are a few levels of the thing, you know, gradation to the spectrum. So you can be creative with your practice and shift back and forth. Let's start with uh, level zero. This is before you discover meditation where you're completing the ego mind without any awareness. And then you begin to meditate, you know, you create this observer to witness the ego. This is your basic mindfulness, or a dual vipassana, where you're applying 100% concentration on the object of meditation, say the breath, or just scanning your body. And again, the object of meditation can be anything from like, you know, again, breath, body sensation, sight, sound, thoughts, emotions, um, whatever, anything you want. Uh, after you access a good amount of concentration, you can start to divert some of that power of a concentration to your peripheral awareness and be aware of the sensation arising in the background, say sound. And as if you posture on the sensations even more, in turn, uh, the quote-unquote true self will keep expanding and expanding. Eventually, you let go of the one-point awareness or concentration completely. And then you take on the perspective of the panoramic 360 awareness itself. And then you do vipassana from this non-vantage point. Okay? This is the non-dual vipassana, so-called vipassana. Now it's just uh, sight vipassanizing itself, sound vipassanizes itself, thought vipassanizes itself. Because by this point, the vipassanalizer has become another object in meditation. Arising in the same open condition as all the other sensations. Now you're just meditating without the observer or directing your attention from subject to object. So it's almost like you're uh, using the God mind to meditate or uh, to do Vipassana instead of the human mind, okay? But ultimately, the Buddha mind and the everyday mind are one and the same. That's the ultimate realization. So all levels are equally valid. But anyway, so in Vipassana, there is still some kind of effort in there. Although by this point, um, it doesn't feel like it's coming from the meditator anymore. You're still focusing and noticing in a really, really gentle way uh, sensations. And this is where you get the uh, experiential insight that sensations and awareness are one. That's true unity. And now you're in the realm of the do nothing meditation. And then you let go of even that. You let go of letting go and then just go on with life. And once you have a glimpse of it, you're like, holy fuck. How come I never noticed that what I really am is faster than the sky, viscerally. And all experiences are vanishing uh, the moment it rises <laughs> out of nowhere, like the wind blowing. 
My toes, the face, the mitsu, the thoughts are in the same space as the clouds. All is in equal footing and the whole field is perceiving itself uh, through one unified sense store of zero. So everything is allowed and nothing is affected. It's almost like nothing is ever happening. Now just because all that is unfolding spontaneously, it doesn't mean that there's nothing to do on the spiritual path. Awakening uh, can be approached just like learning any other skills, like playing the piano. And for artists and musicians, you usually need to uh, be trained in classical painting or music for like years or decades to be able to uh, play, say, freestyle jazz or thinking or uh, uh, paint abstract painting without it looking like shit, be in the flow state. So you have to apply effort to be effortless. So you got to seek as hard as you can until the seeker exhausts itself. And speaking of the spiritual seeker, uh, looking back on it, it's nothing more than a commentator in your head, commenting on the process that um, ultimately there's nothing quote unquote, you can do about it. The tricky part is though, when you dissolve a part of you, the rest of the solidity that hasn't been dissolved will always sneak up on you. Cheeky cunt, uh, the ego. It sneak up on you on the surface and then commenting on whatever new insights or realizations and experiences that are manifested as a result of this uh, dissolution. You're like, oh my God, I became more empty. No, no self, <laughs> making progress. Who is commenting on that? The rest of the self. Ta da So as long as you still have that voice in your head, trying to make sense of what's happening, trying to figure it out, then there's probably more uh, solidity to be dissolved. But I see a lot of people that just spiral into this loop of commenting, dissolution, commenting, or having experience, and then interpreting it and strengthening the spiritual ego. See, anything that you can't let go of, it's you that you can't let go of. How do I let go of my girlfriend? How do I let go of my attachment to having a nice physique or being a CEO and making money? Contents are irrelevant. Just go into the physical sensations in the body-mind and then release. Release the clenching, release the grasping, release the uh, contraction and solidity. But you know, ultimately, all those different programs are all connected to this one gigantic program at the root of it. That's the program of the self. Because if the self is not dissolved, you're just going to transfer one attachment to another. Now I'm going to go spiritual now. Now you attach to spiritual experiences and chasing after mystical highs. You kill every single Buddha on the road until there's just one left. You're the last teacher and then you let go of that. Your emotions would arise as like smoke rather than solid. Yes. Other people are like solid. So when you feel them... There was a stage where I was really sensitive to like energy and feeling other people's emotions. Like I would go to the temple maybe, or like, you know, oh my God, this temple has good vibe. The other temple has bad vibes. This person has a good vibe. This person has a spiritual vibe. Oh, that's still the projection of your ego and conditioning. So if you're like going around experiencing other people's energy, in a sense, you're experiencing yourself. If I cleared up my own resistance, then I wouldn't have. Yeah, you wouldn't be affected by other people's energy, whether good or bad. But the thing is though, that's actually the purest form of experiencing other people. You're experiencing other people at the deepest core of their being, which is nothing because they're experiencing yourself at the deepest level. So that's the difference between compassion and empathy. So compassion is the ability to help other people in a state of total equanimity without getting triggered. Love with a capital L is kind of like a cold love. It's like uh, almost like a divine love, right? In the absolute sense, it's neither self nor others. But ultimately, when you feel another person's emotion, you're picking up their emotions. It's you as a separate self that's getting triggered, right? And you're just piling out each other's conditionings and creating more karmas in the world, okay? So when you're at peace, you experience peace everywhere, in everyone. See, when the ego dies into love, you become love itself. And like the sky that cannot feel itself, uh, this type of love is impersonal and beyond human passion and emotions. And you wouldn't even call itself love. <laughs> so conventional love, it still exists. It's nested perfectly within this love with a capital L. So you're closer than close to everything. You're enlightened by a billion things. Everyone everywhere is like eternity gazing back at itself. <laughs> and this is happiness without conditionings. See, before you remove all the lenses of perception, all your love is dependent on conditionings. Right? Afterwards, you can slap back on any lenses you want, depending on you know what's more pragmatic in this moment. You know, the lens of the god, the human lens, uh, the monkey lens, the AI lens. Uh, all simultaneously if you want, or none of it. Gotta be the infinite shapeshifter, brah. Even emptiness, I think, is a stepping stone that you can use to fill out more like connectivity and love. Or emptiness, you know, what is emptiness? It's empty of separation and distinctions, right? And the more you love, the more empty the self becomes. So it's like a positive reciprocal feedback loop. So people tend to create an identity out of being this compassionate being before this process is completed, right? See, after you wake up, the universal will will just drive you to do things, you know, for no reason at all. 
It's neither for self nor for others. It's not for this mission or that because everything is perfect. Even when people that feel like rupture and bliss in front of like gurus, most of that is still your own projections. So I'm pretty sure that to realize people who is completely empty out, who feel uh, rupture, uh, I mean some kind of oh dissolution when they meet each other because there's nothing to transmit to each other in a sense. So if you hear like two people arguing over like what enlightenment is, either one of them is still asleep. Well, both of them are. <laughs> just back to like regular life. Do you recommend just like following desires? I just always kind of intuitively know like trying to resist desire is just another resistance. Suffering is pain times resistance, right? So you can also say suffering is pleasure times resistance. You can say it like that too, right? So like you know, if you really want to do something, if you resist it, that sensation just kind of multiplies and just becomes something even more like. Terrible. So all I did was I did my formal practice for like two hours a day, and then I just lived the rest of my life like I would normally did before. And slowly、uh, my desire started to become less and less. And after a while, whatever you do that is in line with truth will make you suffer. And at first you kind of have to、uh, keep fine tuning it like a dial. Eventually you just flow with it spontaneously, and life just won't take you to places that will make you contract. Now I'm not a Buddhist, but why do you think a lot of traditions tell you not to、uh, commit on wholesome acts? Let me just talk about the three pillars of development. You have shila, that is morality, ethics, and you have concentration, and you have、uh, wisdom. So wisdom, there's just ultimately one wisdom. That's emptiness. And then you can, the three branches of emptiness are suffering, impermanence, and no self. And you suffer if you、uh, perceive anything to be solidified. In the flow of these impermanence、uh, sensations, there's not a self to be found. Oh, that's how the three are interconnected. Okay, the whole point of concentration is so that you can have the one pointness of the mind to see wisdom. That's why concentration is important. What about shila? The reason we have that is because if you are your mind is clouded with the fucked up shit that you did, unless you're a psychopath, you're not gonna have the peace of mind to sit down and concentrate your mind and see the wisdom. And the deeper the, the insights within the wisdom are, the more that you can see how. Oh, wait a second. I'm not separated from anything. If I hurt other people, that means I'm hurting myself and I'm hurting the world. And the more concentration you have, the more wisdom that you can see and penetrate, right? And again, the more、uh, wisdom and the more concentration that you have, the more、uh, in turn that you can see how fucked up your character has always been. Now, with that said, I have an explanation for why some gurus abuse their students or why cults are formed. So, the more in contact you are with reality. The more propensity, or a potential, or capacity you have to enter out to set of consciousness or mystical experiences, you know, oftentimes most people,、uh, but not always. So it's not a matter of direct causation, but correlation. They're related, but not the same thing. Okay, all spiritual experiences, again,、uh, I can't emphasize this enough. You know, all out of state of consciousness are the byproducts and the side effects and the symptom. Of、uh, the dissolution of the separate self, okay. So people who don't have big self to begin with, maybe don't have a lot of solidities. Then I might not have any or a, a lot of spiritual experiences. So the ego state is an outer state. Peak mystical highs are outer state. You're waking up from that into the unouter state. See、so、even stuff like Kundalini. What are chakras? It's not mystical. It's just blockages in the body. And when that gets released, you get some high. When all of your chakras are released and open up and awaken, you're not gonna feel them anymore. So in a way, all those Kundalini cons and thoughts is just tripping on、uh, the, the junk of their subconscious. It's just content. The same thing could be said about jhana junkies. See, when you truly merge with something, both sides vanish. So you can have no idea what reality is, and not be formally awake. And still have great talents to enter outer state of consciousness. That's why a lot of spiritual athletes, right, they get trapped in their own ability to enter outer states. I mean, it's okay to wave around your attainments.、Uh, Buddha did the same for entertainment and inspiration, but he knew that the whole dharma is empty and that he transcended even the transcendental. And this is why a lot of、uh, people worship gurus, you know, who have the gifts to enter outer state of consciousness on demand, but they might not be fully awake. So they tend to abuse and take advantage of their powers, and manipulate spiritual seekers、uh, because the outer state of consciousness for like spiritual cons is like the thing, like candies. But ultimately, truth includes everything. You know, every every part of your process is part of it. So let me just talk about the two of the last things to eliminate before full awakening. 
The first is the arrow of attention, and the second is the background substrate of experience. Now look at this diagram that I'm showing you right now. It makes things more clear. Um, so first you have the standard uh, perception, that's your ego phase. Uh, and then you have the witness phase. And then you have the God, my God consciousness phase. And then you have no self. And then finally you have the full 90 state. That's no self, no center, no direction of attention, or attention or awareness without any directions. Now this is so subtle and profound that most people just miss it. Because if there's still a distinction between the background and foreground of experiences, something as sensations, again, uh, our sight, sound, thoughts, feelings, the body, objects, everything, uh, arising in and out of, uh, there's still a duality uh, between the experiencer and the experienced. The knower and the known. There's still room for suffering. <laughs> so the observer, the observation, and the observed. They codependently arise through the process of uh, the causes and conditions of the universe that's just happening by itself spontaneously. Not even the arrow of attention is in your control. So if you empty out the subject or dissolve the subject, you also empty out the object. And if you rarefy the object, you also rarefy the subject and vice versa. See, what, without the object or the subject, there's no movement of attention. You know, the world has always been fully awake without your help. You're not generating or creating this knowing. Are you conscious of consciousness from some place in the head or behind the eyes? Or is consciousness conscious as itself without any locations, distance, directions, space or time? So as a matter of a direct experience, consciousness is not resided in the head. The head, the body, the whole world is inside and made up of it. Right? When you're conscious as consciousness, consciousness is a substrate or an idea vanishes. When you fully realize God, God disappears. When you fully and truly find the self, the self vanishes. That's the paradox. Because when you truly become or realize something, it completely disappears because it's like an eyeball that cannot see itself, but it sees everything else. Now it's useful, just part of the process, to transfer your identity from the small self to the big self, right? And use that as a ground or a substrate to continue uh, the rest of the dissolution. But when you completely disappear into awareness, awareness as a substrate will vanish. Now you're just free-falling. Now at first it's very scary, very frightening. That's where the dark night of the soul comes from. But it can also be extremely blissful. But all that's relevant. You know, a dark night or, or even bliss or rupture, that belongs only to the, to the separate self. It's a reaction to truth, right? But the good news is though, it's not scary once it's all said and done because there's no ground, so you cannot fall. But what happens to most of the spiritual seekers is that they get stuck on the ground, and before that separate self is completely vanished, it's always going to cling on, grasp, verify, or own whatever it's perceiving or experiencing, and turn it into another object of identification. This is some game that the ego is playing with itself. <laughs> You know, or you transfer that insight or realization into some kind of uh, truth or uh, the nature of the ultimate reality or self, uh, which is completely unfathomable. Well, that's another way to perceive emptiness. You know, emptiness is not just an empty cup or nothingness or uh, perceiving reality to be a hologram. There's that, but it's also empty of conceivability. But you have to be a nothing before you can be everything, not even a singularity or a point. Now, once you see throughout the last speck of tension that you're still trying to hold on to, uh, it's not even in your control, then the last speck of the doer dies. Paradoxically, it's the lack of agency that gives you complete freedom, because now you transcend the duality between free will and determinism. <laughs> Nature itself doesn't give a fuck if it's free or not. I suspect that maybe a lot of seekers or even gurus who talk about how I am God or I am awareness or merging with some source haven't completely emptied out the subject. So they make a thing or an object out of the, the object or the background. Now the object isn't just something that's out there. It could also be eternal objects like you know, thoughts and feelings. Why do you think you're identified with your thoughts? Because you're creating a thinker or an observer looking at a thought when all are void. <laughs> Now it's just God fucking itself raw without any gaps or distance. So don't rarefy anything that I say here. You gotta empty out even emptiness. But paradoxically, it's the sense of inconceivability that allows you to sink deeper into reality as reality. 
in this fill in the blank, it feels like uh, the separate entity is not aware at all or paying attention to anything. This is why I always say true nature is like the merging of a permanent cessation with infinite consciousness. Because you're totally dead, that's why there's only life. So again, no subject, no object. Therefore, no foreground, no background. And no energy is needed to direct attention from one to another because there's no here or there. All right? And after this uh, knot of perceptions is untied, I get an average of maybe four hours of sleep a night. And I don't get tired when I live because we spend so much of our energy creating this false sense of entanglement and separation. Now, I have a much cleaner way for reality to experience itself. A much more natty way. <laughs> a brand new operating system where every sensation simply syncs up to itself, is aware of itself, and perceives itself in their own place with perfect symmetry. See, when you're nowhere and everywhere, there's no delay between this or that. It's like quantum entanglement, uh, but without the entanglement. <laughs> See, no cluster of sensation ever owns, is aware of, or syncs up to another cluster of sensation, or grasp, or uh, entangle another cluster, right? So it's very difficult to deconstruct this with dual vipassana when you're doing it only from the observer. It is only by doing Vipashayana, when one is identical to the Godhead, can one dissolve the Vipashanalyzer, the Vipashanalyzing, and the Vipashanalyzed. And eventually, the Godhead also Vipashanalyzes itself, uh, and then you deconstruct the background. Now in the herd, only the herd. In the scene, only the scene. In the cottonized, only the cottonized. See, when you take a cluster of sensation and using that to hijack another and pretend it's perceiving another, all that's due to conditionings. You create a false sense of a seer, hearer, doer, thinker, feeler, and identity and all that clusterfuck of sensations are what's creating resistance, tension, grasping, clinging, and suffering. So in this state, there's no more sense of merging. It's not a temporary state like jhanas or a psychedelic experience that you can come in and out of. And this is a deathless. Now, if sensation, is appearance, is source, then uh, phenomena are neither coming nor going, erasing a duality uh, between the unmanifested and the manifested. Nirvana is samsara, and there's no more contraction and expansion. Now, if this sounds complicated, just visualize uh, you're a bird at first, uh, the ego, and then through meditation you create another bird to watch that bird, that's a witness. And then you become the wide open space, not just around, but manifest both birds and everything else. Now, I keep saying space, but it's not exactly like space. But space is the best metaphor because it has no limitation or boundaries. It's awake and every part of it is equally aware. Now, if you ever feel like you're just going to infinite regression of a watcher watching a watcher and so on, that means there's more solidity that hasn't been evaporated because again, nothing is watching anything else. Sensation arising as nothing, abiding in nowhere and vanishing into nothing. So even impermanence is seen to be empty. So, you know, you go beyond space and time. Without time, there's no nowness either. A lot of people get stuck in the power of now. And they solidify their sense of self to, the, to be mindful of the now. But even now is empty, right? Because if uh, what's given rise to the now, uh, namely the past and the future, are seen through to be illusions, then the, the present moment cannot be a solidified uh, thing either, or a ground that you can stand on. But again, at the relative level, all that exists, you know, self, space, time, you know, you can verify them to interact with the world, you know, at the pragmatic and relative level, but ultimately, when you empty out those things, those phenomenons, when you verify them again, fabricate them again, you do so without any attachments. And you see that the entire paradigm of spirituality is another fabrication. But everything is still there, but not there, like the rainbow. Even perception is fabricated because you don't know what the fuck you're perceiving, right? Even fabrication itself is yet another fabrication. But if everything is fabricated, then nothing is. You're raising another duality. You know, they say, uh, wake up, clean up, grow up. Now, why in that order? Because um, if you don't want to wake up first, it's like putting on lipstick on a pig. You're replacing a better conditioning with the worst one, but it's still conditioning. It's it's like creating a new avatar that's doing the cleanup. Just like creating the observer to become a better meditator. But once you wake up, uh, all your conditionings and uh, traumas will get sucked into the void. Right, as Shante said, you wake up in the, in the head, in the mind, in the heart, in the gut. Eventually, your entire nervous system is cleansed out. And throughout the, the process of this unfoldment, each layer of the dream is going to manifest uh, in different sets of insights, uh, realizations, and experiences. First, you dream that you're an ego. Then you dream that you're a witness, or observer, or awareness. Then you dream that you're a god or some kind of uh, infinite being or creator. 
Then you dream that you're nothing. And then you merge and transcend all previous stages. And there is just this, which has no levels, right? So if you hear people talking about like, accessing different levels of consciousness, they're just uh, unfolding uh, the conditionings, right? It's not like consciousness actually gets higher or lower. It's just that the more you unfold and evaporate, the bigger the opening seems in relative to the mind. So the key is to go down vertically to the source of consciousness. But on the way to the source, you can go horizontal. So most people, it's like a zigzag line down. And the horizontal realm is your visions and mystical experiences or even cities and powers. Now it's easy to get sidetracked. You know, some people get stuck on one level and then they just go horizontally. <laughs> they just get lost all the way out. And you're actually going deeper into the dream that way. The whole point is to wake up out of it. So you can say awakening experiences are the temporary transcendence of the self. But so it's going to contract back unless you permanently drop away the self. That's liberation. Now what happens after you merge out of the source, you become an absolute normie. Depicted in the last picture of the 10 ox herding picture. The ox is a metaphor for enlightenment. Uh, the man writing it is uh, the metaphor for the seeker. First, you have a glimpse of the ox, and you catch it, then you tame it, and you know how to ride it. And eventually, you transcend both the man and the ox. It's like you complete the hero's journey, and now there's no hero, there's no journey. You become an absolute normie, neither physical, nor spiritual, nor mental. <laughs> Uh, almost become invisible, but your moment to moment experience is that you create all of reality and be the master of both the absolute and the relative as they merge as one. From a certain lens, you kind of return to what you've always been as a biological organism before all your human karmas and conditions started to pile up. And you see that all thoughts are just brain secreting, and that sensation is no different from pancreas secreting or like heart beating, anus pooping, lungs breathing, dogs barking, and clouds dissipating. Okay, so when it's all said and done, the body just wants to do what makes it happy. You know, eating, pooping, finding the right maid, cuddling, sleeping to maintain a state of equilibrium. The way that nature is always designed itself to do for all living organisms is to operate under its one intelligence. Let's get up! You know, all practices lead to the same space. So the key is to find the interconnectivity that connects all the practices and find out which practice and what combination of practice works for you. Even something like self-inquiry, you can't do that effectively if you don't have concentration. Basically, just ask yourself, well, what am I? Who am I? And any answer that could be generated by the mind is not this, not that. Everything that you can perceive, look at, experience, you just label it as not this, not that, natty, natty, natty. Can you feel an emotion? Not this. Can you perceive the body? Oh, there is no body parts. They're just thoughts. Not that. <laughs> Can you observe thoughts? Oh, the thinker is just another thought. Not this, not that. Where and what is the mind? And who and what is doing that investigation? Not this, not that. Can you be aware of awareness, conscious of consciousness? Oh, even perception is imagined. Not this, not that. So you're basically objectifying your entire field of experience. When you objectify everything, the subject vanishes. Now, Jim McKenna has a, a technique called uh, spiritual autolysis. Basically, you're writing down everything that you think is true and until you, there's nothing true left anymore. So you're gonna get down to the bottom of it all, the last question, when you reach the edge of the mind. So the last question is, is it true that nothing's true? And if that question is also a no, then you run into a paradox. I have no choice to transcend the duality between truth and untruth, dream and reality. Now my videos also serve as kind of like the same function. Every single video that you see uh, my, me upload, pre-awakening is sort of like a question, a layer of my, the dead skin of my ego. Every time I upload something, I dissolve it. The way you're talking about it, it's just like doing the practice and then you'll get these like states. Stages of like I'm like really far away from it. The first time I actually had an, like a profound experience in meditation was two years into it and it was my, during my first retreat. And then nothing else happened after that for like three more years. Uh, the first real major shift, which is like stream entry, the, the first level of awakening happened five years after I've been meditating for like two, two or three hours a day. So it takes time. It usually takes about five years of like daily practice, one to three hours, usually. Do you think it's good to alternate like body scanning one day and then do nothing? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a good idea. But I would say if you, you should always have one core practice that you, you hit every day. A basic routine for me back then, I would do an hour of practice of just body scanning. I do uh, two one-hour sessions a day. Uh, the second session I would do 
uh, body scanning for like maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes for warm up, and then I'll move on to other sense stores. And I will visualize the sight, um, visual field, and then sound. And then I'll go inward again and visualize and pay attention to thoughts, just watch my thoughts. And then I'll move on to uh, emotions or feelings. Emotions and thoughts are actually coupled. So if you just sit down and watch your emotions without interfering with them, without trying to change them, without judging them, without labeling them, and just let them come up, they'll be released. And the thoughts that are attached to those emotions will also dissolve. And you can do that from thoughts too. If you dissolve certain thoughts or beliefs, the emotions and the traumas and whatever, the feelings that get attached to those thoughts will also vanish. And with thoughts, you can further divide, subdivide thoughts into mental talk, mental images. So basically, you're trying to like take apart the, the congealed and bundled up uh, version of the solidified self and then take them apart and see that there's no center anywhere. And there's nothing, no one's holding all those different sensors together. Ultimately, you see that inside and outside, no distinction. Uh, the last 20 minutes, I'll do the do nothing meditation, I'll do the uh, total relaxation and just bring all the different sensors together as they merge as one unified sensor of zero. If you don't have an hour to do your meditation practice, that's what I would do. So you get both the expansion and contraction side of it, uh, the equation covered. If you have like two hours, I would do one hour dedicated to concentration, all concentration, all vipassana. And then the second half, you do complete relaxation, surrendering, do nothing meditation, Zochen. Um, go to a retreat. That's a very important thing. Go to a retreat every year or every two years. Because you get more out of one retreat than you do sit an hour every day for like six months or a year. Because at the retreat, you just keep going deeper into a more subtle, subtle level of the mind because there's no chance for you to pile up more conditionings because there's no external stimuli. Now with psychedelics, if you choose to use it under the right set of settings and use it safely, a uh, heavy trip uh, once a year, uh, super set that with the retreat or once every six months, three months uh, with moderate dose, uh, it could potentially speed up the process. The way you use psychedelics now is to not focus on the content, but then just let the dissolution happen because everything experienced in psychedelics is just a byproduct and a symptom of that dissolution. I would say 99% of the people who are into psychedelics have it backward. Oh, okay, so it's coming from the subconscious out into like a virtual Psychedelics is basically shadow work on steroids. Okay. When you completely stop dreaming, the psychedelics won't do much for you anymore. So when you unravel the condition very quickly, of course you get insight into reality, right? Because what is insight? The insight is just the way reality is, without separation. Do you end up remembering your past lives? I don't have visions about past lives, I don't have visions about reincarnations or whatever. Before I had some crazy shit. <laughs> I had a lot of moments of reincarnations. I even saw, I saw my past life, you know, lives before me, my ancestors, my mom, like whatever, even back to the dinosaur and the Big Bang. When there's no self, there's nothing to reincarnate. So when you stop dreaming, you also stop dreaming about your past life. That's why they say you just stop being reborn. That's why nobody wants enlightenment. They just want a spiritual experience. They just want to have a better dream. When I was going through the path, I had no idea. You, you're not gonna have any idea until you finished it. But it wasn't until after all my dreaming stopped that I realized, oh, that was just a dream. And then to get from there to here, that's not your choice. Because an ego can never want its own demise, right? The ego can never imagine its own annihilation. So from the shift to, you know, you know, being the peak of spirituality, having all this crazy vision to, to now, ultimately, it's not my choice. It wasn't my choice. It just happened to be that way. So it was sort of like an accident. <laughs> yeah. Like the cause and effect of the universe. Yeah, it's just the cause and effect of the universe. Yeah. The oh. thing is, you, you can never understand something unless you lost it. That's why you can't understand the ego until you lost it. You can't understand what, what God is until you, you let go of God. It's only on through the next like level can you understand the previous one. Like what happens after death? Let's just say someone points a gun at me without knowing anything about brains or bodies or consciousness or reality. He asked, what would happen if I pull the trigger, do you think? Based on my own direct experience right now, which is an out-of-body experience 24-7, um, I'll tell him for sure, experience will continue to experience itself, even if my body is destroyed. But that doesn't tell you anything about consciousness. I'm not making an ontological claim or about uh, where consciousness comes from or what is reality. 